Hey, I want to uh, talk to you today about uh, what, what God says about uh, he, the servants who were in a big argument. They uh, were they wanting to set beside the right hand of the Father. And uh, Jesus put them in perspective real quick. You know, he said, uh, if you want to be great in God's eyes, let me just read it to you. Let me, re let me read God's word here to you. It says here in uh, Mark chapter 10, uh, verse 15, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached Jesus and said, Teacher, we want to do whatever we ask you. We want to do whatever we ask you. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus always asked that. You know, he's now a dictator. I notice he asked people, even when they want to be healed, or when he was praying for them, he always asked them, What do you want me to do for you? He asked them, they answered him, Allow us to sit at your right hand and your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup? I mean, to go to the cross uh, or that I drink or to be baptized or the baptism I'm baptized with? They said, we are able, they told him. And then Jesus said to them, you'll drink the cup I drink and you'll be baptized with the baptism I baptize you with. But to sit at my right or my left hand is not mine to give. Instead, it's for those for whom it has been prepared by, of course, God himself. When the ten disciples heard this, they began to be indignant with James and John. Jesus called them over and said to them, here they are, arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Here's how, you, here's how to be the greatest. Jesus puts into perspective real quick. Here's how to be great in God's eyes. You know that those are regarded as rulers of Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. But it's not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to be great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. For even though the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. May God add his blessings to his word. If someone up here serving in the church this week, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to be preaching about you this Sunday. And there we have several people to serve, to serve around here. Servants. You know, I can remember... Even as a teenager, uh, I got in the back seat of this one guy's car, and I said, home, James. You know, that was my limousine ride. Uh, we, we like to be served rather than being served. Even on the TV, they'll make you feel like, you know, at the prom, at the wedding, you got the big limo, and you're there in the back seat. Somebody, take me here, take me there, do this, do that. So uh, we're, we've arrived if we can demand service from others. That's what, that's what we've been taught. Jesus, however, measured greatness in terms of service, not status. Service. God determines your greatness by how many people you serve, not how many people serve you. And that's where the disciples got, they got into big arguments. Sometimes we'd rather be generals than privates. And uh, God wants us to be servants in his church. To be like Jesus is to be a servant. Because you know why? That's what he called himself. Jesus called himself a servant. God sometimes, he tests, he tests us, he tests us by asking us to do tasks we're uncomfortable with. Your primary ministry should be where your passion is. Find a job that you love to do. In the church or even in the business world, find a job that you love to do, that you can't wait to get up every morning and go there to do that job. And I've always told people, if you love what you're doing, you never have to work a day of your life. Just, just love what you're doing and have a passion to, to, to do that. And uh, God wants, uh, he says, your servant's heart will reveal your maturity. I asked uh, some people there a while ago to uh, hand out uh, those charts. And I know some people just jumping. They have a servant's heart. You don't, even, you don't even have to ask them. They see a need, they feel it. They do it. They do it right then. They're always available. They're always available to serve the master. It don't take any special talent or skill to pick up trash or uh, sweep after a meeting of the church. It takes somebody with a character and a special servant's heart. You know, it's, it's, it's possible to be in a church the entire lifetime and not be a servant. Just show up. God wants us to be a servant. 
How can you know if you have the heart of a servant? Well, I'm glad you asked. This is what Jesus says. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 16, you can tell what they are by what they do. That's what, that's what Pastor Scott's been preaching on. Faith without works is dead. We've got to get to works part. By the way, I get a break in the new pulpit here, Joy. Appreciate that. Man, I'm telling you right now, this, this is heavy duty. It looks good. Hey, listen to this, uh, this, this story here. A writer from Huntsville, Alabama told this. Said he told, he told a, as a boy, he said he was lounging around on the living room floor watching TV. His dad came in from shoveling snow and saw him there and said, Son, in 24 hours, you won't hardly remember what you're watching on TV. How about doing something for the next 20 minutes you'll remember for the next 20 years? I promise you, you'll enjoy it every time you think of it. What is it? Well, son, there's several inches of snow on old Mrs. Brown's sidewalk. Why don't you walk over there and shove all that snow off and, don't, and get back home without her even knowing about it? He wrote, I did the walk in about 15 minutes. She never knew who did the job, and Dad was absolutely right. It's been more than 20 years, and I've enjoyed that memory every time I've thought about it. You see, there's a blessedness that comes from serving others that you'll never get when you indulge in yourself. This is, uh, this is what Jesus says in Matthew 20. But among you, it should be quite different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must become your slave. For even I, the Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve others. And Jesus says, and to give my life as a ransom for many. Ephesians says this. You know, you know you're the only one like you in the world. God gave you special gifts, talents, and skills that no one else has. I, yesterday back here we was working on the ceiling and there was a certain individual I thought we, we're not going to get this right there was a sprinkler head there was a sprinkler head coming down and you had to measure and then the cone of these things come off don't ever mess with a sprinkler head by the way <laughs> you might get all wet yeah. these things come off and you got to get a hole saw and cut it but you got to measure this way this way, this way and get the hole right in the middle to cut that thing out right that looks easy, don't it? It's not easy. But we waited till one certain individual could come, and he had done it, and it worked out great. He cut it, and we put it back in there. And Billy, you're right. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of things up in this ceiling. Please, we, if we ever, ever, this place used to be a laboratory, a marketing firm, and whoever else knows what else was here. But there's millions and millions of wires and cables and conduits and pipes and ducts. and Anyhow, Somebody said, uh, and Christ gave gifts to the apostles. He made some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to go and tell the good news. That's all of us, sir. We ought to be all, everybody here ought to be able to, go, be able to go out and tell the good news. And some to have the work of caring and for teaching God's people. Christ gave some of those gifts to prepare God's holy people for the work of serving to make the body of Christ stronger. Let me just say this one time. You're the only one who can do what you can do. And you can do it better than anybody else can do it. Because God gave you a special gift and a talent and a skill, and he wants you to use it to build the kingdom. When you do that, all of us are better than any of us. That's the way synergy works. We're, we're all together as a team. There's no stopping what Grace Point can do. Amen. It says something about you on a, on a Sunday morning here in March with snow outside that you made an initiative to come to worship God in the church. God will bless you because of what you, you made the initiative today. You made your mind up. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord this Sunday, and you came to church to worship Him. That says a lot about you, about your wanting to please God and glorify Him. You realize how Jesus and the church can be enhanced by your willingness to serve, even in the small areas. Every menial task in the church is important. Every attempt is a win. By trying, to doing your best for the kingdom of God, you're going to be noticed one of these days. You're going to stand before God and He's going to tell you about the things that you did or didn't do. And uh, if you're not involved in service or ministries, what excuse do you have? Listen here. Abraham was old. Jacob was insecure. Leah was unattractive. Joseph was abused. Moses stuttered. Gideon was poor. Samson was codependent. Rahab was immoral. David had an affair and all kinds of family problems. 
Elijah was suicidal. Jeremiah was depressed. Jonah was reluctant. He was running from God. Then he was running with God. And then he's running to God. And hopefully that's where we're at, running to God today. Naomi was a widow. John the Baptist was eccentric. Peter was impulsive and hot-tempered. Martha worried a lot. Anybody here like Martha? Worried a lot? The, the Samaritan woman had several failed marriages. Zacchaeus was unpopular. Thomas had doubts. Paul had poor health. And Timothy was timid. That's quite, a, that's quite a few misfits in the Bible, but God used all of them in a mighty way. All of them in a mighty way, the story. So, Lord, help me not to make excuses in serving you. Repeatedly, the Bible says to serve the Lord with what? All your heart. Let's say that again. Serve the Lord with all of your heart. There's a lady here at our church now, and that's her motto. She says, whatever I do, I want to do wholeheartedly with all of my heart and give everything for the Master. And man, does she ever. All of our abilities come from God. God has given each one of you an ability to do certain things well. Every ability can be used for God's glory. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Listen, the Bible gives different examples of what God uses for His glory. Here's just a few of them in the Scripture of what their, uh, their abilities was. Artistic ability, architectural ability, administering, baking, boat making, candy making, that sounds like a good one. Somebody has that skill, I'll be glad to sample the candy. But debating, designing, embalming. I'm not sure about that embalming. <laughs> Embordering, engraving, farming, fishing, gardening, leading, managing, masonry, making music, making weapons, needlework. That might be pretty good for the safety team right there, Joy. No, no, weapons. no, weapons. no weapons. No weapons. Needleworking, painting, planning, inventing, carpentry, sailing, selling, being a soldier, tailoring, teaching, writing. There's a lot of them, aren't they? And you have the same gifts and same talents. You have special talents and skills that no one else has. And the Lord hath needed you. He needs your work. He needs your skills. All of us working together, just calling and inviting somebody to church. Maybe we'd be like James and all bring 12. We'd have to have three services on Easter. We're going to have two services, and our goal is to do 500. I believe we're going to be over 500. I believe, it, I believe you've been inviting people, praying and inviting that they'll hear the good news of the gospel. Wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody would give their heart and life to Jesus Christ next Sunday because somebody you invited, you give one of the little cards to that Chuck presented to us that tells us about it tells us the who, what, when, where, and how. Uh, the good news of the gospel. God one time said that this pastor, all he preached about was the gospel. All he preached about was the gospel. And this, this member of the church says, gospel, 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 gospel. All you ever preach about the gospel. Why don't you preach about something else? The pastor said, well, what do you want me to preach about? He said, pills. Preach about pills. And the guy said, the pastor said, pills. So he thought about it all week long. He got up next Sunday morning. He said, well, let me tell you something. He said, there's big pills and there's small pills. There's blue pills and there's white pills. He said, there's pills that make you wake up and pills that make you go to sleep. And there's pills that stop your anxiety. And there's also the gospel. <laughs> and he said, that's what I'd like to preach about today. God said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the Bible in a nutshell. That's the gospel. You know, God wants us to be his messengers. He wants us to be his mouthpiece and be his representatives. Amen. Different abilities. There's different abilities that we can, we can use our particular ability to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. God has a place for you in the church where your specialties can shine and you can make a difference. And it's up to you to find that place. Keep, keep trying. Keep experimenting and find a place. What I'm able to do, God wants me to do. The Bible says that God equips you with all you need for doing His will, building His kingdom. God has given each of you some special abilities and make sure that you're using them and passing them on what God has blessed you with. What you are is God's gift to you. What you do with yourself is your gift back to God. 
the gifts that God gives you. That's the way it works. God gives you many, many gifts. And uh, you have dozens of hidden abilities and gifts. And you don't know sometimes because you've never tried a lot of them out. A lot of them out. Do your work well, and then you'll have something to be proud of. But don't compare yourself with others. The Lord never wants us to compare ourselves to somebody else. Look at, don't look at somebody else and say, well, they can do this, and uh, Jimmy can lead the worship, and Joey can play the guitar, and he can play instruments, and, and Rosemary can play the piano. I'll never be able to play the piano like Rosemary. Well, God give her a special gift and a special talent that he didn't give you and me. You know what? But maybe you have gifts and talents that, they, that they'll need you to help them with. And that's the way it works. Real servants make themselves available to serve. Servants don't fill up their time with other pursuits, but they, they be, they're available. Make yourself available for the, the serve in the kingdom of God. Much like a soldier. No soldier in active service entangles themselves in the affairs of everyday life so they may please the one who enlisted them. Are you available for God anytime? Do you make yourself available? Can He mess up your plans without you becoming resentful? As a servant, you don't get to pick and choose when or where you'll serve. Being a servant means giving up the right to control your schedule and allowing God to interrupt it whenever He needs to. That's the heart of a servant. Somebody here yesterday said they'd come in here early at 7 o'clock and they was going to work to 9. And they left out here at 4.30. They just got into it. Man, we was having fun. I seen ladies said, man, isn't this fun? And she gave this other lady a hug and said, man, this is so much good fellowship. And it was. You know, when everybody's working together doing something, one man brought his two sons in, started, and this, fiber, this is fiberglass uh, ceiling tile. We're getting rid of that and putting a new in. And that fiberglass means there's little pieces of fiber with glass in it that goes down in your hand. I can tell you that I still got some in here. This, they're not out yet this morning. I've been trying to pull them out. But this, this man brought his two sons in and started carrying that fiberglass out and storing a lot of it. And uh, I thought, what a great example. Them boys will never remember that snowy Saturday morning at Grace Point Community Church when their sons come and they help with the work day at the church. And they made a difference. They made a big difference. That's setting good examples. Rural servants pay attention to needs. Whenever they see something done, they just do it. Our philosophy around here is if you spot it, you got it. Somebody said, well, this needs to be done. This needs to be done. Did you see that floor? Did you see all of them? Did you see all that dirt on that floor? Yeah, just like you. Get a sweeper and clean it. <laughs> this, I like the, did you see all that? Did you see all those marks? Did you see those marks on the wall back there? Did you see all those marks on the wall back there? Yes, I see them just like you. Get you a Mr. Clean pad and wipe them off. Get you a little Windex and paper towel and wipe them off. That's what, that's what we do. We look for things that we can help out with. That's a real service paying attention to needs. Whenever we have an opportunity, we have to do what is good for everyone, especially for the family of believers. The Lord puts a priority on His people there. You hear, you hear what He's saying there? He says, whenever we have the opportunity, we have to do what is good for everyone, especially for who? The family of believers. God wants His people to be taken care of. He wants His people to be given really priority here. You're, you're his family. You're his people. Not that everybody else is not important, but God's people are very important. Never tell your neighbors to wait until tomorrow if you can help them out today. Boy, that's, a, that's really important, isn't it? If our neighbors have got a need, we need to, we need to help them. This, this one time, there was a few years ago, I think I made one of my neighbors upset. The one neighbor next to me had a bunch of trees blow down. And so I just got, you know, I seen him out there cleaning them up, so I got the power saw, and we was out there cutting them up and stacking them up and trying to help him get the lambs out of his yard. Well, the other neighbor come down to me and said, you know, you're putting a lot, of pressures on, a lot of pressure on your neighbors. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're out there been working all day, helping this, helping this guy with the limbs and the brush and stacking all this thing, things up. I said, well, he had a need. He said, yeah, but it makes it look bad on us. I said, well, you know, you could, you know, there, you could come down and help out too. I didn't, you know. I wasn't trying to make him look bad. I was just trying to help my neighbor. That's it. He had a need. John Wesley was an incredible servant of God. We are Wesley and Arminius when we, when we talk about the, the uh, Church of the Nazarene. Listen to what John, this is his philosophy, his motto. He's an incredible servant of God. Do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can and all the places you can 
at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. That is greatness. That's a lot of cans, isn't it? I've heard that success comes in cans, not can'ts. I'm just say it. You can begin by looking for small tasks that no one else wants to do. Do these things as they were great tasks because God is watching. When I was in the business world, I, I worked as a district manager for AutoZone at one time in my life. I was always looking for the guys when I was a store manager and moving up in the organization. I was always looking for the guys. When I'd give them a list of things to do, they'd finish those lists and come back and say, hey, I got that list done. What else you want me to do? I said, there's the guy you want to look out for right there. There's the guy or the girl you want to watch for right there because they are hungry. They're wanting to get things done. And they're wanting to get the job done. Servants never say one of these days or when the time is right. If you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. You know what the old saying is? If you wait for all the lights to get green, you'll never go downtown. <laughs> if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. God expects you to do what you can with what you have wherever, where you're at. Less than perfect service is always better than the best intention. Real servants are faithful to their ministry. Faithful. Are you faithful? Can you be counted on? Can you be trusted? Servants finish their tasks, fulfill their responsibilities, keep their promises, complete their commitments. They don't leave a job half undone. They don't quit when they get discouraged. They're trustworthy. They're dependable. If I needed a heart transplant, or Hubert yesterday was here, you say, I couldn't make it because of the snow. Well, the born again supervisor made it yesterday. <laughs> he was here. Hubert was here. He was over here this morning. Isn't it? Sure good to see you, Hubert. Man, hey, I tell you, we've been missing around here. God, can you be counted on? Can you be counted on by others? Are there promises you need to keep, vows you need to fulfill, or commitments you need to honor? This is a test. God is testing your faithfulness. If you pass the test, you're in good company. Abraham, Moses, Samuel, David, Daniel, Timothy, and Paul were all called in the Bible faithful servants. I was getting ready to say, if I, had a, if I had needed a heart transplant and I knew that I was in Christ's hospital and they had one in St. E, would I, would I count on you to go get it and bring it to Christ if nobody else could make That's Are you that faithful? Could I trust you? Did you do whatever it takes to get the job done? I read a book one time called The Go-Getter. Uh, I had a guy, I used to work with a guy one time, said he was a go-getter. He said every morning he'd take his wife to work and in the evening he'd go get her. <laughs> I'm not sure about that kind of go-getter. I read a book one time when I was first in, uh, they was training me for management. This book is called The Go-Getter. And this guy put this, put this young boy in charge of finding a lamp for his wife. He said, this is the first job I want you to do. He said, I know there's a lamp in this town. And he said, would you... Would you go get this lamp for me? It's a special lamp. My wife's wanted one of these all of her life. Would you please go get this lamp? And would you make sure that I have that by Friday at 5 o'clock because I got a special surprise for her? We well, know the town was about 5,000 people. And he knew there's only one lamp in this town, but he wanted to test this. He wanted to test this young man. So the young man started out. He looked in this store and he couldn't find it. He looked in this store and he couldn't find it. He looked in this store and he couldn't find it. He looked in several stores that day and he couldn't find it. He was discouraged. And Tuesday, he looked in this store and he couldn't find it. He looked in this store and he couldn't find it. He looked in this other store and he couldn't find it. He went to the store manager and he said, do you know anybody that would have this lamp? He said, I don't know anybody that would have this lamp. Wednesday went by. Thursday went by. Friday went by. He said, I have got to find this lamp. He said, this guy is wanting me and he's depending on me for his wife's birthday party. And he finally found a guy on Friday evening at 3 o'clock that had that lamp. Because he went to every every business in town and he asked the managers and he described the lamp. And he had the lamp there by 5 o'clock. I'm saying that to say this. <clears throat> the guy did whatever it took to get the lamp. He didn't stop. He did whatever it takes to get the job done. And that's why, that's why the Lord wants us to be. You don't stop when you have a roadblock. Do whatever it takes to get the job done. 
that kid was a go-getter and ended up running the company later on in his life because the, the boss knew this kid is who I'm looking for. He didn't stop. He, he tried every place in town, and he was, that was the name of the book, The Go-Getter. God wants us to be a go-getter. Hey, one day we're going to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many, many more responsibilities. Let's separate together. By the way, faithful servants never retire. They refire. They don't retire. They serve faithfully as long as they're alive. Rick Warren, I know Pastor Scott said this. Rick Warren says, as long as you have a purpose, you're still alive. And you're still alive because you still have a purpose. And God has a purpose for you. Could be praying. Could be encouraging. Just could be loving. Could be giving. They serve faithfully when they're alive. And I've noticed this. Real servants maintain a low profile. They maintain, or they don't, they don't get in. Put on the apron of humility to serve one another. If recognized for their service, they humbly accept it, but they don't, they don't allow notoriety to distract them from their work. Paul exposed a kind of service that appears to be spiritual, but really just to put on a show to get attention. He called it eye service. Eye service. Serving to, to, to serve the crowds. To be really to be noticed by people is not what we're talking about. It's serving behind. There's so many people in this church serving behind the scenes. You'll never know what they do. There's people this morning back in the Incredibles room. There's people today back in the nursery. There's people that comes in and clean this church every week. There are so many people that greet outside. There's many people that serve behind the scenes. I can't mention them all, and I'm not going to mention any names because when you start mentioning names, you'll forget some of the key people. So you can't mention any names. But we do this for Jesus. We do this for Jesus. What we do, we do for Jesus. We do, we do our best and give it our best and do whatever it takes for Jesus. When you do good deeds, don't try to show off. If you do, you won't get a reward from your Father in heaven. I don't know where you've been watching the, the basketball games or not. Many of you have. But there's a team I've been keeping my eye on. I don't know anything about them. It's a little team from Loyola in Chicago. Those kids know what unselfishness are. I don't, I don't, you know, they're not my favorite team, but I've kind of I've kind of appreciated what they're doing, watching them in the tournament. They're in the Final Four. They're doing something right. The coach seems like he's unselfish. I don't know how many times the kids could have laid a, could have made a layup, and they seen a big guy coming, they dump it off and let the other guy make the layup to make the points. Unselfish. Being unselfish. It don't make it, it don't it don't matter who gets the credit. Give him the credit. An audience of one. We are an audience of one. We're, whatever we do, we do it all for the glory of God. Where you eat or sleep or drink or whatever you do, whatever you work, wherever you serve, you do it all for the glory of God. If we're still trying to please men, Paul said, I would not be a servant of Christ. You won't find many real servants in the limelight. In fact, they avoid it when they're possible. They're quiet, content, serving in the shadows. Now, hey, don't be discouraged when you're mowing the yard, Jeff, and nobody says anything to you. Jeff and Junior, his dad, mows our yard every year. Talked to him this morning. He said, we're ready to go. The blades are sharpened. The oil's changed. Let's get her. It ain't going to be long when snow melts and the sun pops out. It's going to shoot up about a foot. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. Don't be discouraged when your service goes unnoticed or you're taken for granted. Keep on serving. Throw yourselves into the work of the Master, confident that nothing you do it's a waste of time or effort for him. Even the smallest service. Jesus said, if my representatives, you give even a cup of cold water to a little child, you'll surely be rewarded. Servants think more about others than about themselves. Servants focus on others, not themselves. Listen to this. This is true humility, not thinking less of yourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. They're self-forgetful. Paul said, forget it yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Jesus emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. When was the last time you emptied yourself for someone else's benefits? You can't be a true servant if you're full of yourself. It's only when you forget about yourself and what we do that we deserve to be remembered. I'll never forget the church I pastored this guy come in, he said, my job's in trouble. 
he said, my children are being disobedient. I've got a lot of problems with my children. He said, I'm broke. He said, I got some stuff rented. And he said, I'm, I think they're getting ready to come and get it. And he went down the whole list. I mean, any kind of problem you had, this guy had problems. And it wasn't 30 days I put this gentleman to work. He came into church. I said, well, we need to do this and this and this and this and this. And he came back in 30 days. He said, you know what? He said, man, he said, when I come to this church, I had all kind of problems. But he said, you, you got me so busy around here now, I forgot about half of them. And he said, you don't seem near as bad as you used to. He still had the problems, but he was focusing on serving rather than the problem. And God will, work, God will help you work them problems out if you get busy serving Him. He says to seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these other things in life will be added unto you. Try it. If you don't believe it, try it. Put Him first in your life every day. Prayer and devotions and church and serving Him, worshiping Him and getting your heart right in His eyes and being pure in His eyes and see what happens to your life. Watch Him turn your situations around. Watch Him turn things around in your heart and in your life. Amen. Jesus emptied Himself in the, taking the form of a servant. Servants think like stewards, not owners. Servants think like stewards, not owners. You know, whatever you have has only borrowed. This church is borrowed. Our house is borrowed. Our cars are borrowed. Everything we have is borrowed. We're living on borrowed time. I had a friend this week said, you know, I can't believe it. I had a real, real good friend. We went to car shows together. We showed cars together. 51 years old, and bam, he's going. He's going out of eternity. He said he, was, he worked out. He, he was healthy. He eat right. And I don't know where's a heart attack or an aneurysm. But 51 years old. Think about that. I, I know that sounds old to some of these teenagers and young adults. That's young. Linda, that's young, isn't it? No, uh, no one thing. Uh, just you know what? You're only one. We're only one step from eternity. Just one step. One step between you and eternity. God help us to be ready. Help us to have our spiritual house in order. James, we're only one heartbeat from where we're going to spend eternity. One heartbeat. One breath away from where we're going to spend eternity, forever and ever and ever and ever. Somebody said eternity was the longest word in the dictionary. It is when you think about where you're going to spend eternity. God help us to be ready and be prepared to meet the Lord, to meet Jesus. That's, that's the most important thing. In closing, I want to tell you this. The, the, the main thing, make sure that your life is in order. Heart on fire